Hello again. So in this video, I'm going to be talking to Andy from Four Priest Brewery. Andy was very kind to send me a few bottles of his Murgy Straits Golden Ale after I mentioned that I was going to be having a go at brewing this beer. So I wanted to do a video about uh, that brew and how the beer came out and obviously a little bit of a comparison to his beer. But I thought maybe before that I could do a little bit of a interview with him and talk about his experience as a new brewer uh, setting up the business and running it and all the rest of it and also to get a little bit of insight into this recipe before I get on to uh, the brewing of it and so on and so forth. So that's what it's going to be about. I uh, hope you enjoy the discussion. Apologies, my audio isn't the best on this because I was using a new microphone and I cocked up a little bit in terms of setting uh, the gain, so there's a little bit of distortion at times. But uh, other than that, I hope that you enjoy the uh, conversation and find it as interesting as I did. So, cheers. <laughs> Okay, so welcome Andy from Four Priest Brewery to the channel. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. And I'm sure a lot of people um, who follow my channel are probably already aware of yourself um, via the kind of UK home brewing community and obviously your own uh, channel as well. For anyone that isn't, um, if you want to see kind of the, the full documentary evidence of some of the stuff that Andy's going to talk about today, then um, jump over to his YouTube channel. And obviously there will be a link to that uh, in the description below. So um, get over there, drop Andy a sub and um, yeah, get up to date with what's going on because uh, I've been really enjoying sort of catching up on some of the videos. I wasn't there from the very beginning, um, but uh, since I've uh, got into your channel, it's been really uh, interesting to sort of follow that journey through. But I'm not going to um, tell everyone about all of that. You're here to kind of uh, tell us that from uh, from the horse's mouth. So, um, yeah, I've kind of introduced you already, but do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, about sort of four priests uh, yeah. up to this point? Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you. And uh, I was subscribing to your channel before I got into any of this, by the way. So a long, long time, uh, long time viewer and subscriber. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks for sending a few subs my way as well. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a it's a weird story. Um, we, you know, long time home brewer. You know, taking the usual path that most of us do, sort of starting with wine kits and extract kits, and then. You know, I wonder if I could do this properly with grain and then in the kitchen with a giant pan and a big mesh bag, um, you know, and um, and then, you, you know, you, you kid yourself into thinking, if I spend a little bit more on slightly better equipment, I'll make better beer. And you spend the money on the grain father or, or the <laughs> yeah. Brazil or whatever it happens to be. And um, and actually, it's not the equipment. It's the, it's the technique, right? And we know that. So, uh, but But eventually, I got to a point where, the beer that I was making was pretty decent. I, I kind of preferred to drink my own beer than, than anybody else's. Um, and, of course, you have this kind of uh, thought in the back of your head, maybe one day, maybe uh, I can do this and do it professionally. People will buy my beer. And then you quickly write it off when you realize it's going to be a hideously expensive thing to do. Um, and you haven't got the expertise and you haven't got the training and you haven't got the qualifications. Um, and that was where I was. Um, local homebrew group around here in South Cheshire, members from Sandbach and Congleton, some places you may have whizzed through on the motorway a few times. And um, we'd meet up and have a few beers. And, um, and then one day, one of the guys in the group told me that a pub was closing down uh, in the next town along. Um, the guy that ran it, unfortunately, had passed away. And the, the brew kit that was in there was a two-barrel brew kit, so pretty much 400-litre tanks, no HLT, mash tun, uh, copper, single fermenter, a few pipes and pumps and bits, and um, uh, he wanted rid of it. So when I had a chat with him one Friday night, we did a deal, a very good deal, um, and I picked it up on the Sunday, um, not having discussed it with my wife, not having <laughs> any plan whatsoever, just like, hey, how, how did that go down? <laughs> yeah, hey, darling, I'm sorry, uh, I've accidentally bought a brewery. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then it was a case of, do, do I do something with this? You know, have I got, am I brave enough to, to do it? And um, mm -hmm. so we said about having these conversations locally with a few pubs and a few bars and a few other home brewers, just sort of gathering as many opinions as, as I could. And we decided to go for it. And that's where the story starts on on, uh, on YouTube with episode one, collecting the equipment, 
and episode two, having decided that we were going to do it, trying to find yeah. premises and the whole story since find the premises, filling them out, digging drains, digging holes, um, you know, the tail end of recipe development. Because honestly, the first beers were extensions of homebrew recipes that I sort of tried and tried and tested actually. So, uh, and that's what we are. So we celebrated our one year anniversary of uh, the first brew day just in May last month. Um, 23,000 pints sold, about 1,000 bottles sold, um, and not making a huge profit, but we're still here. And, you know, it's not not the case with many small breweries. And I think the way that we set the business up um, it should stand the test of time. Um, mm-hmm. we've, all, we've all kept day jobs, me and my wife. My son's a full-time student, um, so we're not overstretched. So we can continue to make beer um, and um, uh, 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 and you know, have fun at the weekends with a little bit of side income, but actually it's not about that right now. Maybe in the future we'll, we'll start to generate a more meaningful income and it could be full time, but you know, for the time being, we'll keep it as it is. Yeah. That sounds brilliant. So, um, how long had you actually been brewing before this opportunity sort of came along and you, you obviously yeah. just jumped at it, but, um, on and off um, for, for a long time. Now, I'm 52 now. The business is running for a year or so. Um, prior to that, you know, through my 20s and 30s, I would sort of dip in and out of it. But, you know, mm-hmm. my, my first brewing experience was, was with my dad probably in the 90s. And we would make wine, you know, airing covered yeah. wine. Um, and, um, you know, <laughs> you know, and I sort of, it, it just appealed to that sort of, sort of engineering bit of my brain, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I wasn't, doing what i'm doing i I would i'm sure i'll probably be involved in some sort of uh engineering um uh, you know i'm I'm involved in the electrical electronic world so you know there's a bit of engineering there as well and that just appeals to me you know how how you can turn this stuff into something else it's alchemy isn't it and um and uh you know through my i guess teens and 20s sort of dipped in and out pretty much always extract you know, brewing kits. Uh, and it was really only in probably, I would say, maybe 2016, 2017, I really mm-hmm. started to get back into it. I think all grain probably didn't really come until probably 2017, 18, I would say. Um, okay. You know, when I realized that it was uh, it was um, something that I could do in the, in the house. You don't need, you know, yep. sophisticated equipment. Uh, I'd always imagined that it was a much more complex process than, than it really is. And actually, it's not. It's relatively simple. You don't need so much kit. Yeah, for sure. I think once you um, once you realise that you can basically do it with a stock pot on a stove, I think that's yeah. the slippery slope for a lot of people, isn't it? You go, okay, I'll just get a little bag and yeah. throw a few bits of grain in there, and then you go, okay, well that works all right. I've made eight bottles though. Really need <laughs> yeah. to be making more than that if I want to, uh, you know, spend three, four, five hours doing it. So, and, absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of where it started for me, and then yeah, obviously the rabbit hole runs yeah. long and deep. <laughs> it does, Especially it does. if you end up with an actual professional brewery setup as well. <laughs> well it a bit, does it? Yeah, it's been a bit extreme in my case, but yeah, but you know, it was a slippery slope, and um, you know, large pa- large pan, larger pan. Where can I buy an even bigger pan? Oh, there's actually companies yeah. making kit specifically for what I want to do, and. Um, you know, I, I think the first one I bought was uh, from um, Angel Homebrew. I think it was. It was a thirty yeah, yeah. liter all in one. Um, and then I found uh, Clawhammer Supplies video, uh, YouTube channel, and um, they'd got this really fantastic kit, which just looked amazing to me with a mesh basket, no bag required, yeah, and a separate controller. So. I took a look at that and I ended up speaking with them, but it just wasn't available in Europe. It still isn't available in Europe as far as I know. So, so I'm going to make one of those from scratch. So bought all the necessary bits and pieces, the grain basket, scouring AliExpress for parts and, and built it from the ground up, which allowed me to build 50 litre badges mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in the kitchen or produce 50 litre badges in the kitchen um, on, on some kit, which was remarkably similar to theirs. In fact, I've done a video about it. It was like a tribute build of their of their kit with the, that I did, and it, it was amazing. Um, you know, if ever they uh, sell their product in in Europe, then um, you know, even now I would I would probably have to take a look at it. Um, you know, there's, there's some other good kit that I was always take, I always had an eye on, and never never quite could raise or, or justify the cost. 
that was the problem. So it was always kind of how can I DIY this? And that that kind of spirit carried through into the brewery uh, when we when we started going professional. You know, how can I do this for less than these professional companies are trying to trying to charge us for these for you know for this equipment? Do I need that new fermenter? Can I manage with mm-hmm. something that's not intended to be a fermenter? Can I build a cold room rather than buy a cold room? Let's build it from scratch. We'll do it ourselves. And um, I think that homebrew experience of trying to do everything on the shoestring really, um, really helped us to get into a position where we're actually profitable pretty much from from day one because we didn't overstretch with lots of expensive shiny equipment and we're producing a really good beer as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I think the untapped reviews that we've got online, you know, support that as well. You don't need to buy fancy schmancy expensive equipment to make very decent beer yeah for sure and like you say i think that's you know evident from you know the homebrew level all the way up really it's um it's definitely more kind of technique and process led in a lot of cases and you can have there's certainly probably plenty of people who are making not that great beer with really expensive um <laughs> beer. so yeah. yeah yeah um yeah i think it's interesting there's always there, there seems to be uh, so many people who are into the hobby where that kind of engineering and technology aspect of it is um almost yeah as important to them as the actual kind of beer making um to an extent i mean uh i've not quite got to the level of um like building the uh, sort of electronic kit and stuff like that but you know i've done the um building the kind of keysers and fermenting fridges and all that sort of stuff and um yeah a lot of that has been as enjoyable if not more than the actual brewing um at at times so uh, i think it's um yeah, it, it there seems to be a strong thread of kind of like amateur engineering enthusiasts who are also home brewers for sure. Yeah, um, definitely. I can see how that would definitely help, and obviously we see a lot of that in your videos as well, where we're we're going for the slightly more Heath Robinson approach on some of the uh, um, <laughs> some of the equipment that we're putting together and stuff. But I mean, that's uh, you know, to be fair, that's a hell of a lot more interesting than watching somebody just buy something off the shelf and you know drive it into yep. the brewery and set it down on the ground right so um yeah. yeah um so yeah as somebody who's recently kind of transitioned from obviously a homebrew background into um being a professional brewer what's what would you say is kind of like the best aspect of it for you so far bearing in mind obviously <laughs> as people who watch the channel know you're kind of doing it part time at the minute but um what what's the best thing and what's what's probably the worst thing um for you at the, the moment. best thing for me it was like and you know most of your audience most of you guys that are watching are, are probably um probably producing beer same as i was and and there's a there's a feeling that you get when you you make a decent beer and your friends come around or your family come around and you hand them out and it's like it, it, if you cook it's the same sensation you cook a really good meal it's the same feeling you get when you look around the table and they're tucking in and loving it and you, you kind of feel wow i i made that i did that right yeah. and if you can imagine when we first went on sale in a pub um and people are queuing up at the bar and they're ordering your beer and they're going back to the table and they're drinking it with a smile on their face and then they're coming back for another one i can't describe the feeling it it's ecstasy it's unbelievable you know the 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 uh, the buzz that you that you get from it certainly for the first one uh, you know and and I was speaking with um, I was speaking with Harry Brew sixty nine at the time I sent him a text saying I can't tell you how I'm feeling right now and he said just enjoy it while it lasts because it's not the same the second time but that <laughs> first day when we were selling beer um, and I was in the pub people didn't know who I was uh, you know I'm just listening to them talking they're like wow this is really good. This is really decent beer. Is it made in the town here? Right. Oh, yeah, that guy set it up, set the brewery up, and he's making it. It was such a buzz, I can't tell you. And, you know, trying to reproduce that feeling is quite difficult. Um, yeah, I can imagine. I, again, I absolutely would. You know, the, um, you know, just um, just the, the confidence it gives you as well, I think, that, you know, once people are prepared to pay money for your beer, yeah. um, it kind of validates everything that you've done. It's like, wow, it worked, and people are paying for it, and they enjoy, they're enjoying it. When when you're home brewing, there's always a little that kind of bit of a nagging doubt that oh yeah, people are coming around and drinking my beer, but of course they are. It's free. <laughs> you know? You're right. And what are they going to say? You know, they're in your home. And like, yes. what are you? Oh yeah, it's lovely, Richard. 
Yeah, exactly. Really? <laughs> so, it's, it's like the same know, as if you're cooking them a meal; they're not going to sort of spit it out. Yeah, oh, that's disgusting. You know, you know you're, you're listening to people that don't know it's you, and um, what do you think? Oh, it's awesome, fantastic. And uh, and a couple of weeks later, when they had a beer festival, in fact, it was the Folk and Boat Festival in Middlewich. It's just happened again this year. But um, and just being part of the crowd and listening to people, what are you drinking? Oh, I'm drinking Murgy Street. Oh, I've heard of it. What is it? Oh, just try it. Oh. Wow, that's really good. Amazing. I'll go, go get one. You seem coming back with two. It's just like, I can't I can't describe it. It's amazing. Amazing. Um so that's the positive. But, you know, <laughs> from a, you know, the negative is um is the time that it sucks out of your life, you know, when mm-hmm. you're like like I am working full time with travel, you know, getting around Europe and the US and I'm away for extended periods. Um when you get back. You know, time with the family is really important to me, but sometimes, you know, how can I coordinate all this so that I can spend time with the family and make the beer that I need to make because we're going to run out quite shortly. So, you know, Elliot, my son, our son, will come to the brewery and brews with me there now, and that's sort of dad and son time now. Um, you know, I will always try and make sure we've got at least sort of a good chunk of Sunday to spend with my wife yeah. and Sarah. And, um, you know, she's been super supportive, um, you know, mostly by just letting me get on with it without you know interrupting me with a lot of things that i probably should be doing she stopped asking me to mow the lawn to put the bins out and stuff now because she knows that you know trying to squeeze that in as well into my week is just crazy yeah. gets the cars washed and all those yeah. things so you know the support from her has been incredible as well but you know i literally need another day a week to get it all done uh, and that's not available clearly so it's sort of leaked into the the weekday nights a little bit as well so you know, we'll deliver on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night now. Um, occasionally, I'll speak to some, you know, pub landlords and pub managers about, you know, overdue payments and stuff. Although most of our customers are really good, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'll have to call them in the evenings. Um, I, I really try not to let it impede on my day job because ultimately, that's what pays the mortgage here, and uh, and I love doing that as well. You know, it's a great job, but um, trying to keep separation between those things and still have some recovery time. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been a, a negative, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing that you're fitting it all in, to be honest, because, you know, I mean, even even us home brewers will uh, struggle to find the time <laughs> just to brew for ourselves, let alone to uh, to run a business, especially when, well, I mean, you're kind of doing it at the same times that most of us are, as in, you know, weekends and, and evenings yeah. primarily. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I can see how at, that being a bit more of a commitment would probably be a, put a little bit of extra strain on you for time wise yeah uh, for early, sure. early starts early starts late finishes i'm in the brewery typically on a saturday i'm in the brewery around 6 a.m um but, but actually the brew doesn't take it really doesn't take any longer than um, than a home brew would you know five mm-hmm. hours maybe six hours with some cleanup um it's all the other stuff that surrounds it you don't have to fill in forms for hmrc you don't have to yeah. kind of balance the books you don't have to you know, keep all the quality systems up to, up to date. You know, it, it's just the brewing and the cleanup at home. Yeah, it's yeah people don't really consider good. the admin side of it as well on top. Yeah, and there's a lot of it. Um, there's more, well, there, there is a lot of it, you know. Due diligence for all your customers. You've got to know everything about them. You've got to be prepared for HMRC to roll up at any time to audit yeah. and check that, you know, what you've got in stock is what you say you've got in stock and what you've said you've sold is really what you've sold. You know, they they... They, they they can um, you know they can show up so keeping all that in line is uh, mm-hmm. it's a bit of an admin nightmare. Is that something that's happened to you already? No, or, no, not, no. no not yet, not yet. But you but know, you've just got to be you prepared. Have to <laughs> yeah, Any you've minute, got to be ready. You've yeah. just got to be ready for them to to want to come and have a chat. Um, mm-hmm. Same with lots of other organisations. You know, environmental health, same thing. You know, yeah. they have been. They've given us a clean, full, clean bill of health, five stars. Absolutely happy with everything, but. They could rock up at any point, um, yeah. so you know, keep making sure the place is scrupulously clean at all times. Mm-hmm. You can't get away with leaving it in a state, and you keep your fingers crossed they're not going to come just for a little spot check. At some yeah, point. you can't so, just sack off cleaning for tomorrow no. and go <laughs> just no, deal with no. that tomorrow morning when I can be bothered. You got um, it. Yeah. 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 That ha- might have, might have happened a few times for home brewers for sure. <laughs> um, so uh, I've well, that that's kind of led quite neatly into. Um, the next question that I had for you, which was uh, sort of advice for people who might be thinking of going commercial um, from a, from a homebrewing back, background, yeah. obviously keeping on top of those um, things like the admin and the um, 
and the uh, cleaning and health and safety and all the rest <laughs> of it. But uh, any any other thoughts that you would think are sort of you know key yeah. things that people need to be aware of? I, I would say I would say the big thing you know the big thing is um, for me it is you know just be be prepared to either lose some money unless you're prepared to um, find a way to operate with, with minimal overhead. That's the, that's the mm -hmm. big thing. For me. You know, we've kept our, our overheads to a minimum. Um, and even now, you know, uh, I, I don't mind sharing the numbers. I've shared them before, but we need, we need to sell around 22 casks of beer every month just to cover the overhead. So, five a week or so yeah um just go the overhead because i'm not brewing at home here on the premises i've got a separate bit i've got a separate industrial unit with all the costs associated with that electricity utilities you know water uh effluent uh discharge and all the other things that you've got to pay for um i, I would think if you can find a way in an outbuilding or a garage or you know some part of your residential space um you, you've got a much gentler lead in to the business and i would strongly encourage anybody who's just getting started if you think you're going to be selling you know a, a couple of casks here and there really try and find a way to do that without taking on the burden of um an industrial space to start yeah. with um if you have got some customers lined up and that's what we managed to do um prior to to setting out you know we we spoke to some of the local pubs and bars who committed to us a, a level of a level of business, you no know, X casks a week or X casks a month. Um, so we could do the maths on that basis, uh, and yeah. we worked out. We, you know, we we backtrack from what can we sell a cask for. Um, we we track back to what what are the costs of producing that, and you know, is one greater than the other? It wasn't hard on a spreadsheet to see that we would be breaking even at around sixteen casks a month at that point. Yeah. Um, but if you want to make any money, then clearly it would have been more for us. And, you know, everybody's mileage will vary when they look at it. But, you know, just making sure that, you you, you know, you, you don't fall into the trap of thinking, I can make really good beer and people will just come and buy it. And that's going to cover the costs of a little industrial space. But you've really got to do the maths properly. Um, and I've offered and supported four or five other breweries since I've started who've said, can you share your big spreadsheet with us? You know, how did you work all that out? Um, mm -hmm. And we've done that. And there's a couple of other breweries started up recently who've based their kind of financial considerations on the experience that we had. Um, so if anyone's watching that is looking at doing that, please get in touch. Happy to share how we did it, what the costs were. Um, and, um, you know, maybe you'll have a slightly better start. We, you know, we, we, we were okay from month two. We were, you know, fortunate that the, that the pubs that did commit had lived up to their commitment um, had mm. they not then I'd have been putting personal cash into the business ongoing. And that, that wasn't part of the plan. Um, so keep your costs, keep your costs low. And the second biggest thing is learn how to do stuff that you're uncomfortable with. You know, I didn't know how to dig a drain in a floor. I, I didn't know how to plumb a water supply in. I didn't know how to do electrical work. Um, some of this stuff you've got to be careful with it. It needs to be signed off and approved by somebody that does know what they're doing, but it's considerably less expensive if you do it yourself and then pull in the trades at the end just to make sure you've done it right. Um, you know, what had I not done those things myself or we'd not done them ourselves, Elliot helped a great deal. Um, you know, we'd have added another 20K to the cost of setting this business up. Um, and that was money that we just didn't have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you've got, you've got to go learn how to do things. And if something's not working or leaking, um, it's not a case of picking up the phone and calling a plumber, you go work it out. Um, uh, and, um, that's, it's the only way to do it without extending, you know, a huge cost, uh, which you're going to have to somehow pay back later. Yeah. I think the, um, the idea of kind of starting maybe more from a kind of nano level, it's probably yeah. a really, really good, uh, you know, advice there to people so they could, you know, probably not put too much on the line, but get an idea of what the actual business involves and, and how you can go about it and whether or not there's going to be any kind of market there for you as well. Um, before you then start to start, you know, thinking about, you know, getting premises and all the rest of it. So, yeah. um, but yeah, it's also great to hear that there's lots of, you know, people kind of supporting each other and that you're offering to, to help, 
everyone as well. I mean, it's uh, it seems to be a common theme within you know all the brewers that we've I've spoken to and that we've yeah. spoken to on the podcast and everything that there's very much a uh, you know uh, it's more very much more community based rather than you know competitor based. Obviously, there is an element of that, but um, yeah. I was amazed at that, actually, uh, amazed, because, you know, I come from another world, the electronics components world, and, um, you know, your competitors are your enemies. You want to see them fail, mm-hmm. because that means you've got a greater chance of success. And that was absolutely not the case in the brewing world. You know, my local breweries that are around here, they're fighting for business at the same pubs that I'm chasing for, for orders for casks and kegs. And they jumped in. What, what do you need? Do you need ingredients? Do you need help, support? Can we come and brew with you? We'll help you get set up. Um, and there is that community, community spirit. And uh, it, it took me by surprise, actually. Um, one guy in particular um, runs a little brewery in Crewe, in just the next town along from us, uh, Sean Ailing at Tom's Tap. And, um, you know, when I was getting into the sort of financial calculations, um, he said, come and have a chat. So I went down, we got a beer. He opened his laptop and said, there you are, it's everything. And he showed me every pound and every penny that he spent all year how he worked out the cost of his beer, how he worked out his margins, um, you know, where it was profitable, where it wasn't profitable. Um, and uh, it was an eye-opener. And uh, he had no no need to show me that. You know, I'm a competitor in the next town along, but, you know, we're brewers together, brothers. And um, he wanted to see us He wanted to see us win and, and uh, to succeed. And that's been a huge help. And since then, we've not done any collabs yet or anything, but, you know, we help each other out. He, he needed some there was a bit of shortage of of stainless steel kegs uh, last year. And he was like, I'm desperate for kegs. So I sent him some of my kegs down and he used them for his purposes. And if he's delivering somewhere uh, where we don't go, um, he'll call me, Hey, I'm delivering in Burton on Trent or I'm delivering in Nottingham. You got anything out there? And he'll pick my kegs up or casks and he'll, he'll drop them off with his. Um, It's it's the same for us. You know, we'll, um, we'll help him out. He's, he needed grain a couple of weeks ago. Can I borrow a few sacks of grain? Yeah, no problem. Come get them. Um, and it's it's um, it's heartwarming, and you know that, that it's it's not people who are just obsessing about destroying the competition. There's room for everybody. Uh, a lot of pubs like rotation as well, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for only one local brewery. The pubs don't need that. You know, they need a yeah. selection variety, and they'll rotate us all through the pub. So it's it's good that we're all uh, helping each other, and we'll be around to be able to serve that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, more on the, the the brewing side of things um, for a bit. So, uh, what what were your kind of like influences as far as um, the beers that you you like to brew and what you're brewing yeah. now? I guess as well. Um, what what breweries kind of um, yeah. are you into? And uh, yeah, that that sort of thing. So the beer that I'm producing is not absolutely not the beer that I was brewing as a home brewer okay interesting um, yeah um you know and and i think i think the the reason for that is the is the environment that we're based in here where where we are in a rural Mm. south cheshire farming community with kind of countryside pubs at the canal side um you know the beers that i was brewing before before we set the brewery up were always you know High ABV, IPAs, hazies, imperial stouts, you know, proper, you know, serious heavy beers. Um, you know, I'd, and I'd, you know, I would focus, I would focus on hops uh, and I would focus on uh, hop forward as, as much as possible because that's what I liked, thought that I liked to drink at the time. My tastes have changed as the breweries evolved, actually. Um so, of course, when I roll up at the pubs and say, hey, I'm going to make a mad Russian Imperial Stout, and how many how many kegs of this would you like? And they go, like, one? <laughs> Ever. Um, <laughs> one well, every six that's months. Not yeah. <laughs> that's not a business, right? Um, yeah. What about, what about this, um, you know, super mad dipper with crazy ingredients? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, we might have one of those. Um, but most of the pubs you go into and they say, what's a dipper? What's a Russian Imperial Stout? You know, what they want are sessionable low abv by low i mean four 3.8 to 4.2 mm-hmm. um and i'd ask them what styles are the most popular in their pub and they go like hoppy pails or best bitters 
that's what we've got to work with. There are a handful of specialist beer places, um, Tom's Tap being one, and there's Ebenezer's in crew and a few others. They they will buy the slightly more crazy stuff, but you know, I'm faced with this spreadsheet which says you got 24 a month to shift, five a week. Am I going to sell five a week of these crazy ones? Which I like to make because they're more challenging as a brewer, I think, than a bog yeah, standard four sure. percent sessionable hoppy pale. Um, but we've been out of business pretty quickly, so I took the advice of the publicans in the area. Um, what would you buy one every week of? What would you buy two every week of? And they were, you know, low four percent stouts, maybe up to four and a half. Uh, they were. 3.8 to 4.5 hoppy pails. Um, they were standard English bitters, maybe ESBs occasionally. So that was what we needed to create to fulfill this demand that was there. That's what makes the money. Um, that will form the core of what we produce and does today form the core of what we produce. And then when we're in position and we're covering the overhead and we're covering the costs, then we can start to experiment with some of this other stuff and maybe um, where we're not expected to sell, you know, 20, 30 kegs a week of it. So, um, so that was what, that was why we made the beers that we made. So, you know, I'm going back through my uh, brew father notes and all my recipes, hundreds of things that I've brewed over the years and variations mm -hmm. and rebrews and rebrews and rebrews. Uh, and, um, uh, for quite a couple of years, I would say probably 2018, 19 or 19, 20, all I brewed were smash beers um, because I was trying to get my head around hops. Yeah. Um, so I brewed the same pail over and over and over and I would change the hops. Almost every week, I would brew a five-gallon batch of something um, and I'd try you know, Citra on its own. I would try, you know, Mosaic on its own, Simcoe on its own. And, and I tell you, that's a great way to learn hops. You know, you got a lot of beer you're going to drink, but actually it's the same base recipe. It's all drinkable. Um, you know, yeah. and you're going to give it away and you do beer swaps and whatever. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but you really build your knowledge of, you know, of, of hop flavors, aromas, and hop scheduling as well. You know, if I put loads of Citra in at the beginning of the boil, what happens? And if I don't put any in until the end, what happens? Uh, yeah. And just that repeated exposure to those hops and that's those different schedules really uh, taught me a lot. So I went back to um, a tried and tested standard pale recipe that I've done a million times, which is actually what became Murgy Straight. But I needed some, I needed a hop combination that um, was perhaps a little bit different mm -hmm. um, than anybody else. Um, in that kind of cask, low 4% area. And um, um, I've been drinking uh, an IPA from the Wild Beer Company um, called Wild IPA. Um, and I noticed on the can, it had Citra and Talus. I don't know what proportions they'd used, and I don't know about their hop schedule, but there was just something about that beer that I really liked. So I did a couple of test brews with Citra and Talus into this base a pale recipe that I'd done a hundred times and it just worked. It just worked straight away. It just worked. Um, in fact, it was the second brew that worked. Um, and I bottled it and took it into a few pubs and said, what do you think? Do you think this would work on cask? And they loved it. So that was what we did. We, we, we pushed the button and we went for the big brew, big for us, eight whole casks. Actually it was six whole casks at that point, um, yeah. which we'd sold before, we, before we'd even put them in the tank actually. Um, and um, and that was where we ended up. So, but in terms of my preference for for uh, for, for beers, um, you know, I, I I love Belgian beers. You know, from blondes to triples. You know, you know my favourite beer probably of all time. Um, actually, it's a toss up. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about this, and I couldn't decide between West Marler Triple and and Chimay Blue, one or the other of those two. And I'd love to make I'd love to make a blonde. Um, which I think we could sell certainly in bottle. Yeah. Um, but I'd just be nervous about doing it justice, um, you know, because the you know Belgian beers are uh, they don't look technically complicated, but it, it is complicated to to make something that actually is a good solid uh, Belgian Trappist style. Um, 
but ultimately that's that's something that I would that I would love to do. Um so would that be your uh, desert island beer choice then? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I think a, I think a shimmer blue a pokey one to have as your yeah, uh, only beer. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a bit a bit heavy for a boiling hot desert island. I would yeah. say. I would probably go for a blonde. In fact, I discovered a new beer a couple of weeks ago when I was on holiday, and uh, I've not read anything about it. I don't know if it's. Uh, I really enjoyed it, so. Um, you know, it may well be that people think this is a crap Belgian beer, but it was um, Super Eight Flandrian, and I'd never had it. Before. Not familiar with that one myself. Right. Either, but, yeah. And um, I, it was a you know scorching hot outside, sat on a little bar overlooking a swimming pool where Sarah was sunbathing, um, and I don't do sunbathing; I get bored too easily. So I'm sat there, and I must have drunk three or four of these, and the guy brought them out to me with the sort of traditional Belgian snack that goes with them, which is little cubes of Gouda cheese with pepper grated over the top. And nice. I sat there drinking these Super 8s for about, I don't know, two hours probably until I you know, stood up and thought, I better stop that now. <laughs> um, but yeah, Belgian blondes, uh, I, I, I would say. I, there's, I, would, I would take it to the desert island, yeah, because you know I'm used to drinking it in the sun now, so it would probably be a good one. Yeah, tried and tested now, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we kind of got into the Murgy Strait there, which um, I mean that's that's kind of like your your leading beer, right, um, for the brewery as yeah. far as you know sales and everything. Yeah. Um, so what? Why do you think that beer's kind of gone down quite well? Um, I, I, with, think, I with... think because we um, we listened to the audience, right, and um, yeah, you know, feedback the, the, and the market research. Here, they know what sells, right? Their livelihood mm-hmm. depends on it. So you know, they know if they're going to put, you know any of the pubs that, that that were in, not so much the craft, the couple of craft bars, but any of the pubs, um, you know, if they put on a cask beer that's any more than 4.5%, then they're going to struggle to shift it in three or four days, all right? Yeah. So, you know, certainly when we're talking about cask, um, it's got to be lower ABV. Um, a lot of the pubs that we're supplying are food places as well. So, you know, it's got to, it's got to be something that... Um, you know, isn't so overpowering as to, um, you know, um, it, it's got to go well with your Sunday lunch. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah. some of the beers that, you know, I was proposing just really missed the mark as far as that was concerned. You're not going to sit and drink a Chimay Blue or, um, you know, a West Marla Triple with your roast beef and your Yorkshire pudding, right? Well, I wouldn't. Maybe you would. Um, so, so we listened to them and they told us what would work. Um, and we made it work commercially because we had a honest conversation about price as well you know what can mm-hmm. you sell this 4.2 hoppy pale for and what sort of margin do you need as a publican to make that work which gave me the price i needed to sell to the man um and then we look at the costs and we squeeze the costs um uh, you know we make sure that, that that we're able to turn some profit at that level um so from my point of view, that's why it worked. From the customer's point of view, it's that kind of it. it it's um, it, it fits that gap um, that was apparent in some of these local pubs, where your choice in some of them was, you know, a fizzy lager or a best bitter, and mm-hmm. nothing in between. And a couple of pubs that we're into, you know, they would um, they had a loyal a loyal audience of Carling drinkers. Um, and then we rock up with this citrusy, summery, hoppy pale. And, and because they're local and they're, it's brewed in their town, yeah, I'll, I'll give that a go. I'll give it a go. Um, I won't have a Carling. I'll, I'll try this this one from that guy down the road. Um, and then and I've watched them experience it for the first time and they're like, it actually tastes of something. What, what is that I can smell? <laughs> wow, flavour. <laughs> we dry hop it as well. So, you know, yeah. the aroma. It's like as soon as they lift the glass, they're like, oh, it smells amazing. And all of a sudden, you've got them. They're converted. And they're on it all night. And then they're back for the weekend for more. Yeah. Um, and we've we've migrated um, macro beer drinkers in the area uh, because there was nothing really local to inspire them enough to give it a go. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a craft drinker. It's all too fussy for me. That, that, those guys, right? Mm-hmm. And then we're given this gateway drug into craft beer. It's not too hoppy. It's not a ridiculous ABV. You can drink five pints with your mates, no problem. 
um, and um, and they love it, and and they've stuck with it, and that's what I think's made it work. You know, listening to the audience, and then filling the gap. Yeah, well, I'm lucky enough to be uh, drinking some <laughs> of it right now. So, <laughs> thanks to you very kindly sending me some. Um, no problem. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to try it on on cask, you know, fresh from yeah. fresh from the tap. But I think it translates pretty well to the bottled version still. Um, and it's, uh, I think, some of the stuff you've talked about there makes a lot of sense. And the um, the kind of the hop combination in this as well. I think citron talus. It's um, obviously it's more of a sort of modern take on a you know a, a golden ale with with those kind of American hops in there. Um, yeah. But I think the um, I think that talus kind of still get, lends it a little bit of a um, kind of spicy, maybe kind of herbal note that's um, that still makes yeah. you think of like you know almost like it could still have some English hops in there, um, exactly. but with the uh, really nice kind of citrusy floral kind of notes coming off of it as well. So um, it's yeah. you know it's super approachable as far as. Um, I think, like you were saying, as something for a, a, a Carling <laughs> devotee as a as a gateway into um, more yep. flavorful beers, I can definitely see um, yep. how that's happened. But also for for other people who are used to drinking those kind of beers, just as a, a really nice sessionable golden ale with a really good um, good hot profile on it. So yeah, uh, yeah, I can see why it's doing well. Gold, you know, gold, golden ales. It's a, it's an interesting one, you know, uh, and the the. The designation, you know, the, the BJCP, I think it sits in 12, doesn't it, which is like Commonwealth Pales or something. Mm. And um, uh, and when you when you read it, and I didn't read it before I brewed the beer, it was one of those where it's like, okay, I've made this beer, where does it fit? Um, yeah. Which we've all done, right? <laughs> Especially if you're entering a competition. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> that one. So, um, but actually there's reference in uh, 12A to citrusy hops. Um, yep. And I, I didn't know that was the case when I brewed that beer, you know. And um, you know, when I th- when I think of uh, British Golden Ale, I'm thinking of uh, Summer Lightning, for example. And mm-hmm. um, you know, um, that 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 citrusy that citrusy um, spring like summer aroma, I thought would push it into some other class, but actually, it fit. It does fit into uh, into British um, into British Golden Ale, um, and. Yeah, I thought the other thing that might throw it was um, I decided I wanted I didn't want to be I didn't want it to be over malty because I did want the hops to shine through, um, but we added fifteen percent Maris Otter. Uh, that was the second spin of the recipe. It was all mm-hmm. pale, uh, extra pale actually uh, uh, initially, and I added fifteen percent Maris Otter because I just wanted to give it a bit more maltiness and um, and I thought that would throw it out of style as well. But actually. You know, some bready maltiness is part of the style as well. So, you know, we sort of somehow managed to stay within within 12A. I've not entered it into anything, but it, I think it does actually represent the style reasonably well, in spite of the fact you might instinctively think it doesn't. Because it's yeah, interesting. definitely. I think the um, as far as those kind of guidelines go, they do make room nowadays for the more modern hot choice. I think they've definitely sort yeah. of been, been rewritten um, in recent times to... Uh, reflect the fact that a lot of um, you know a lot of other commercial beers are, are doing the same thing really, and you do look yeah. at the recipe on paper, which again you're kind enough to share with me. And initially, you kind of look at it and go, "Oh, it's a, is is this a golden ale or is it kind of an APA kind of thing?" But then, right. like you say, as you go right. go into it a bit more, and go, "Okay, well the ABV is is lower, so it's definitely yeah. in that more sessionable level." Yeah. And actually, the hopping rate is quite restrained. Um, yeah. I would say it's you know it's probably. Um, a bit heavier on the dry hop than you would maybe see in yeah. a lot of uh, traditional right. golden ales, but actually the rest yeah. of the hopping rate is, is fairly <laughs> modest um, on it. And um, as far as the flavour goes, that means it isn't it isn't kind of overpowering it. Like there is still right. a really nice. Um, you can appreciate the maltiness and the the uh, the grain bill in there as well as those those hops. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think um, like I said, I think it's a, it's a, just uh, yeah a really nice kind of modern take on the, the gold nails so yeah, um, yeah i think it fits into thank that you. category pretty well yeah thank you yeah yeah it's um you know i i i, I would say this because i'm biased i guess but I, I drink i drink it if i'm going to the pub and they've got it on i'll, I'll order it i'll drink it i'll pay for it uh, full price usually as well unfortunately yeah <laughs> um so there you go <laughs> so do you um is this only on cask or does it go out on keg as well so we've done we've we've done um, 
uh, we've done cask and we've done t- we've done two runs of bottles. You've you've got both, I think. Yeah. Um, w- w- the first uh, the first that we did um, was probably a little a little bit yeasty in the bottle. It really mm-hmm. takes a little bit of settling down. That was the first attempt we had at bottling. Um, the second run is less yeasty, but also lower lower carbonation. So and we're, we've actually sold out that second run now as well. Um, and with the second run, it was it was more aligned to the carbonation that you would expect from a cask beer. So um, that's probably the, the closest to uh, the closest to cask that you'd get. We we kegged some in the early days, and um, I think it was probably a technique thing. You know, like most things, we're learning. We've been learning as we go, mm-hmm. and um, I, I don't think we purged the kegs sufficiently. Um, the the hops were lost after a couple of weeks in keg, right. um, the aroma had, had gone, it dissipated. So we only did two as a test and it kind of put me off, uh, uh, put me off kegging it. So, um, but actually with the benefit of another, another six months of experience and we are kegging other beers. Now we've got a keg beer and an APA that, that we're producing and we've, we've managed to, uh, refine the kegging process now. So our expectation is the next batch, which I've just brewed this weekend, we're probably going to, keg half and cask half okay and then of the kegged half i'm going to bottle from those kegs once carbonated because we don't have a bright tank at the brewery yeah. so we're going to do it like well like you would with a corny at home like i would have done with a corny at home carbonate it and then mm-hmm. dispense into bottles uh, and we'll do it that way so um so yeah the next batch should have a variety of packaging formats okay. for people to try if they were if they fancy trying it so uh but we'll probably we'll probably have um maybe six or seven in, in keg and uh, six or seven casks okay we should probably mention that people can actually buy your beer off your website as well can't they if they're not local we can. not right now but i guess yeah. by the time the video goes out maybe um yeah on fourpriest.co.uk there's a shop there um and the only beer that we've had on there so far is murgis straight bottled it's bottle conditioned mm-hmm. um either local delivery will deliver if you're in a reasonable radius of the brewery, we'll do, I'll deliver it, or Elliot, Sarah will deliver it, and uh, anywhere else, then we'll deliver by uh, by carrier, uh, every or FedEx or or whatever. Um, we'll be producing some other um, some of the other beers that we that we do in, in bottles or or cans actually as well. We've also just put a, a canning machine and a can filler, so we'll start to put some beer in cans as soon as I can work out um, how it all works properly without leaking. Yeah. That, that was one thing that you did buy off the shelf then, rather than uh, doing a Harry well, Brew and building it from scratch. So I bought it second hand. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and it's, um, you, um, you've probably got one, and maybe one of your videos, I might have seen you using one as a cannula. So we bought uh, a cannula. I don't have canning um, facilities myself, yeah. no. not. I, not I thought I might have seen you playing with a cannula once. Yeah. Maybe I just, maybe I imagine that. But, um, I'd like to have one, but yeah, a bit, bit pricey for me at the minute. So we, we, bought, um, we bought a second hand cannula. Uh, semi-automatic and um, I'm just in the process of trying to set that up now so we've been canning water for a, a couple of weekends ago we, we tried to can water just to make sure that we could seal them and that yep. the rolls on the can will work and it, it, they're still leaky so just needs a little bit more adjustment and then and then we'll do that okay. and, um, and uh, we bought a duo filler two can yeah duo filler from duo filler Norway um, which again it's it's homebrew level gear, but we're not into volume. So if it takes me a couple of hours to do a couple of hundred cans, that's okay, um, mm-hmm. as we are right now. And as we start to scale, we'll think about more automation, but that will work for us right now. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to be doing a, a sort of follow-up to this video where I'm going to um, brew the Murgy straight and uh, probably talk about that a little bit more in that video. Um so you're all right with sharing the recipe for that, aren't you? Because you've already done that on your yeah. videos anyway. Uh, yeah, um, it's on the videos and I've published it on Brewfather yeah. as well. For anyone that uses that, you'll find it. There's okay, a, great. There's so a couple of we'll versions that people have put up, but the official brewery recipe is definitely on there. The original one, yeah. So we'll, we'll put a link to that in the description for this video as well. Um, I won't go through the the sort of recipe at length at this point because um, obviously we can save that uh, for the follow up <laughs> video, and we've been we've been talking for quite a while now. But um, have you got any sort of general tips for just brewing that beer, or, or considerations for uh, more generally speaking, if you wanted to kind of make a, I guess a, a, a modern golden ale in this kind of style? What's your sort of general um, 
yeah, advice on that front as far as like the recipe and and how you go about brewing it? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I think I, I think it's um, you know if your if your technique's solid, um, the recipe as you'll see when when you look at it, there's nothing special about that recipe. Um, you know, as far as the the as far as the hop um, uh, the hop additions are concerned. You know we're pretty we're pretty late in the boil. You know we've not we've not added a, a, any bittering hops at the beginning of the boil at all. Uh, we're really relying on a you know a gentle bittering at sort of twenty minutes to go. So mm -hmm. forty minutes into the boil is when the first hops go in, and that's enough. You know you you know it's not a bitter bitter. You know it's a golden ale. Um, uh, as far as as far as the um, the dry hop is concerned, you know. It's optional, I would say. Certainly with Murgy, I would recommend it because you know the aroma is 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 amazing, especially when it's served from cask at the right temperature. Um, but even without even without the um, the the dry hop, which I've I've brewed it without the dry hop as well, it's still a great beer. So you know, don't get hung up on, on following the recipe exactly. I, I mm -hmm. would say I would stick with the ratio of citra to talus that I've put in there. I think that works quite well. It's slightly more, um, slightly more talus than citra. Uh, I think is that the right way around or slightly more citra uh, than talus in the boil chill. and the hop stand. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. reversed for the dry hop. Yeah. Uh, and they pair very, very, they pair very, very well. Um, but I would say that the, if I was to offer any advice, if possible, and I know it's a big ask, but, Get onto eBay or Facebook Marketplace. If you haven't got a beer engine, get a beer engine because this beer sings on cask um, and on keg. You know, it's a decent beer, but really, if you really want to enjoy it as uh, as I think you should, then getting yourself a beer engine and serving it on a hand pull. It's not as complicated as it looks. Um, you might have to drink it more quickly, but there are things that you can do to, uh, you know, to mitigate that air ingress into your beer with cask breeders and aspirators and things. So mm -hmm. I would really recommend it. And people that have brewed it, who've split it into keg and cask, have all told me without exception that it's it's much, much better on cask. Um, as it's a as it's a golden ale um, as well, some people are put off because, yeah, but it's warmer beer. You know, it needs to be served at 10 to 12 degrees or whatever. Actually, with a British golden ale, the intention is, you know, it's designed to be served a little bit colder, not at like you know, lager levels of um, of cold, but you know, eight degrees, seven or eight degrees. You know, the hops still shine through. You still get the aroma, and it's a nice, cool, refreshing summer drink. So don't be afraid to chill it a little bit more than you probably would a bitter. Um, uh, and if you can pull it through a hand pull, then definitely, definitely do it. I've been buying them lately to try and set up this little tap room that we've got. Fifty, fifty pounds. You know, it's a chunk of money still. If you, you know, if you if you've got other things to spend it on, um, but I, 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 honestly, if if you can scrape the fifty quid together, I'd definitely recommend picking up a second hand beer engine. It's, it's destined to go on the uh, the hand pull in my garage, so that's yeah. <laughs> that's my intention. Um, Good. And I've got a couple of videos on uh, sort of restoring hand pulls if anyone's interested. So I'll put oh, yeah. those as well. <laughs> you've conveniently set me up for that one there, Andy. So thanks for that. No problem. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to talk to you about today. So um, that's all been really interesting. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, yeah, giving us a, a really good insight there into um, how it's been going at the brewery so far up to this point. And uh, obviously, again, if anyone wants to see all of the gory details of what Andy's been up to, then you can follow pretty much all of it on his channel, which uh, has got some great content. So uh, jump over there and drop him a sub and maybe have a go at brewing uh, Murgy Strait as well, because you've got all the information now that you need to do that. Um, and there'll be another video coming soon where I'll be showing you the, uh, well, if I can recreate this beer, which is... <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> if it's half decent, I'll send some back to you, Andy. <laughs> Please do. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Never All say right. no to free beer. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Thanks again. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll uh, see you on some videos soon as well over on your channel. Cheers. Good luck with the brew. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thanks for watching this video. I just wanted to let you know about a few ways that you can support this channel, which will help me to produce better quality content and get it released a bit more regularly. 
Firstly, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video and leave me a comment if you can as well. You can even show your appreciation by making a small donation using the thanks button. And don't forget to ring the little bell if you want to get notified whenever new content is released on the channel. Another thing that you can do is to check out the video description where you'll find some affiliate links to equipment, books and other general gadgets that I use in the brewery and would personally recommend. If you order through those affiliate links it will generate a small commission for me at no extra cost to yourself. Finally, if you're in the UK and you're looking for some beers to maybe inspire your next brew or you just want to try out some great UK breweries, then I can highly recommend Bruiser, who will give you and me an £8 discount on a case of beer if you use this referral code. These guys provide a great beer subscription service where you get to choose a specific brewery for each box from a really good selection, including some of my personal favourites like Track, Braybrook, Verdant, Baron, Burnt Mill, amongst many, many others. So thanks for listening, and if you can support the channel in any of those ways at all, it will be greatly appreciated. Cheers. I'm the dude, so that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that, or uh, his dudeness, or uh, duder, or, uh, you know, El Duderino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing.